Gray. You are the founder, president, and chief science officer of the Longevity Escape Velocity Foundation. So it's great to have you back on Modern Health Span, and thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me back. So could you describe what are the main aims and kind of goals of the Lev Foundation? Uh, well, um, of course, my goals haven't changed over the years. So it's more a case of my my successive organizations progressing from the previous ones. Mm. Um, so LEV Foundation is really all about um, continuing to play to what I view as my most important strength, which is essentially being a professional heretic, you know, being at the tip of the spear, um, uh, uh, putting forward things that I believe are true and important, but that very few other people believe to be true, or at least are willing to admit are true. Um, and in this case, um, really what's happened over the past, I'm going to say, 10 years, is that the main heresy as of 2009, when I created Sands Research Foundation, has very much ceased to be a heresy. Um, and that was essentially that um, reversing aging, rejuvenation, uh, may actually be more practical, more feasible and easier than slowing aging down. Historically, before I started talking about rejuvenation back in 2000, uh, everyone said to themselves, well, you know, the way in which we're going to postpone the health problems of late life is to make the body, if you like, run more cleanly, insofar as one can think of the body as a machine. Uh, in other words, damage, you know, do less self-inflicted damage to itself um, uh, in the course of its normal operation. And um, people had pretty much given up on, on actually succeeding in that. They had come to the conclusion, which is correct, that the creation of this damage by our metabolism is just inextricably intertwined with the uh, processes that the body needs to do to keep us alive. Um, and uh, yet yeah, they hadn't really been able to move on from that. So I came along and said, you know what, I think really um, we might be able to do this by damage repair, by periodically going in and repairing some of this damage uh, so it, it doesn't get to the level of abundance that causes us to get sick. Because of course the body is set up to tolerate a certain amount of that damage without um, significant decline in function. Um, Okay, so basically that idea was very heretical throughout the whole of the 2000s, really. Um, and, uh, you know, it became quite acrimonious about 15 years ago for a while. Um, but I very much won that battle. Um, I think really the, the, the point that can be said to have been the kind of um, end of the battle was the publication of a very, very prominent paper called The Hallmarks of Aging in 2013, which was essentially a restatement of what I'd said a decade earlier, um, but this time the time was right, and it was said by very mainstream credential people, and so it became by far the most highly cited paper in the whole of the biology of aging this century. Um, and since then I've never had to justify rejuvenation anymore. But the thing about rejuvenation is that it has counterintuitive consequences for lifespan. Lifespan, of course, is a side effect of health span. In other words, you know, if you're sick, you're likely to die fairly soon. If you're not, you're not. So um, the thing about rejuvenation is it buys time. If we have therapies that we can develop over the next maybe 15 years that are fairly good, fairly comprehensive at repairing the self-inflicted damage of aging, then we might expect to be able to take people who are already, let's say, 60 at that time and fix them up. Uh, so that they will be biologically less than 60 for a while. But because the therapies are not perfect, they will, um, the people will become biologically 60 again when they're, let's say, 80, and then they'll carry on going downhill because what's going to happen there is that the, will, the, 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 the gaps in the comprehensiveness of the therapies will essentially take over. We can kind of say that you know, there's easy damage that the therapies work on and there's difficult damage that the therapies don't work on, um, and so the difficult damage on its own will be quite will be enough eventually to make people sick and dead. So the concept of LEV of longevity escape velocity is something I put forward nearly 20 years ago now, and I said, well, hang on, actually that's not going to be what happens because 20 years is a long time in technology, including biomedical technology. 
which means that during those 20 years, people like me, the scientists, are going to have continued beavering away and improving the comprehensiveness of these therapies so that by the time the person is biologically 60 for the second time, um, we're going to have version 2.0 that obviously still repairs the easy damage, but which also repairs some of the difficult damage that version 1.0 did not repair. So we will be able to re-rejuvenate the same people and give them another 20 years and so on. And this leads to the inescapable conclusion that by the time we get those first 20 years, we are very, very, very nearly certain to essentially have solved the problem completely so that people will never get sick as a result of how long ago they were born, however long ago that was. Um, people, of course, who are getting the state-of-the-art therapies at any given point. And, you know, to me, this is completely obvious and, in fact, far more unarguable than my very speculative time frames for how soon we will get those first 20 years. Um, but it, the conclusion in terms of the you know, essential elimination of any kind of biological aging and therefore of any kind of limit on longevity is terribly scary to people. Um, especially it's scary to people who think that, uh, who, you know, whose salary depends on the opinions of politicians and so on. So um, it's, bec it's still very heretical to talk about longevity escape velocity. People who take rejuvenation completely seriously now and are co completely comfortable talking about it publicly will still run away awfully fast when you talk about LEV. So the time is right for me to be going out shamelessly and giving, um, having a foundation that is named after that concept. Uh, so for human longevity, the current situation is, I believe, that we have a 50% chance of reaching longevity escape velocity within the next 15 years or so. And it, yeah, I mean, it is going to mean a lot of changes to the way that we live when, when we get there. Yeah, kind of. I mean, we have to remember that even when this happens, people are still only going to be getting older at one year per year. You know, we won't have mm. any thousand year old people for another 900 years, whatever right. happens. So, and, you know, quite a, lot of, quite a lot happens in 900 years in other mm. ways. And we can, you know, respond to these developments as time goes on. So mm. even if we look at the demographic changes, you know, people get terribly exercised about where will we put all the people? What people? You know, mm. I mean, the rate at which population will grow is actually very modest, especially if you take into account things like, um, you know, uh, women choosing to have fewer kids and so on. Mm. Um, so, um, you know, we shouldn't worry, worry too much. I do worry about changes that will happen suddenly and indeed will happen before these therapies even come along perhaps in the next five years or less, namely changes to how long people expect to live. If people start to realize that this thera these therapies are coming, and even though they don't know how soon they're coming, they think there's a fair chance that they'll be in time for them, then they're going to make very different decisions about what kind of pension plans they want, you know, what kind of life insurance or health insurance or inheritance arrangements or whatever. And that is going to happen soon. So I've been out there for quite a while now talking to, you know, pension funds and merchant banks and, and all manner of people like that um, with, and giving talks whose titles, title is typically something like anticipate the anticipation. In other words, get out there and actually plan what new products you're going to want to put out there for people to buy when they suddenly decide they're going to live a lot longer than they previously thought. Mm, yes. And... I mean, my, my th I mean, because I don't want to retire. My thinking is, you know, that I would like to keep working, but then it's like society accepting that you could work in your 80s or your 90s uh, is still a, still not really there. Yeah, we have to keep. There, we, and this is one thing that also frustrates me is that when people think about a post-aging world, um, they tend to think about it as if nothing else were going to change very much. Hmm. You know, as if it were a world in which we didn't have um, automation or, you know, um, uh, uh, nuclear fusion or, um, you know, artificial meat or pla bacteria that eat plastics or any of the things that we're absolutely certain to have, you know. Um, you know, it's crazy. And especially in terms of automation, of course, you know, we're just not going to have the economy that we have today that essentially assumes full employment. Mm. There is going to be a different way to distribute wealth that does not require it to be done in terms of um, everyone getting a paycheck to do stuff that they wouldn't do unless they had the paycheck. Mm. Um, and that's a good thing. Of course, we have mm. to make sure that people have 
you know, the opportunity to gain self-worth and all of that, but it doesn't have to be the way that we do it today.